right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, and I'm going to I'm going to try to multitask here. I'm also the administrator here, so I'm going to try to admit people while I give my brief introduction. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first of three gardening programs by members of the Bird Park Community Garden Committee. Uh, the ooh, this is really testing my multitasking. Here we go. Uh, the Bird Park Garden Committee grew out of a partnership between the library, the city of Wadsworth, uh, the Wadsworth Area Chamber of Commerce, and the Wadsworth Schools uh, back in the early days of the pandemic shutdown in 2020, uh, an initiative called Wadsworth Knows How. Uh, with the generous support of the city under Mayor Lawbaugh's leadership, who thank you very much is present tonight. Welcome, Mayor. Um, Service Director Robert Patrick and his team at the Parks Department, and most importantly the boots on the ground leadership and sweat and blood of our garden committee uh, all of whom are here tonight and will be participating later in our q a discussion uh, we were able to large launch this park and it was to me a heroic effort uh, and with a lot of passion and we got it done just in time uh, for gardeners to get their plants in the ground for the 2020 season uh, Part of the shared vision of these partners is to build a community of knowledge and practice around the park. And tonight's program is a first in a series of three led by the garden committee members uh, to kick off the season and achieve this goal of learning. Um, I won't go into more detail right now. You can learn more at wadsworthlibrary.com gardens. And as you, we get into the Q&A after the presentation, you're gonna meet our garden committee members and they are the, the guiding mentors in this process. It would help you if you chose to join. And we're always looking for more folks who would also be interested to, to help out on that level. Um, tonight we welcome Wadsworth's own Carolyn and Kevin Kuiper of Kuiper's Farm Stand uh, and instrumental members on our garden committee. Kuiper's are here to assure you that yes, indeed you can garden. Uh, before I turn it over to them, I just want to make a brief note on digital housekeeping for those who just recently joined. Uh, during the Q&A, uh, we'll, we'll allow you to take the mics off if you're unable to, to uh, type in the chat box with your questions, but it does get a bit challenging when we have a lot of people in the meeting to mediate that through video. I'm going to mute any open mics while Kevin and Carolyn are speaking. Um, and then when we move into that second section, if you can, please type your questions into the box. Uh, if you are calling in by phone, don't worry, just go ahead and ask your question and we'll make sure that everybody, uh, uh, as long as time permits, has a chance to engage with the committee and our presenters. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin and Carolyn. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you, Kevin and Carolyn. The screen is yours. Thank you. Um, thanks for spending your evening with us. Uh, we started gardening a few years ago because Kevin thought it would be fun to go to a farmer's market with our extra produce. And I thought he was crazy. But it's worked out okay. So we've gotten a lot of um, community experience and we've met a lot of the people in our community more so than we ever would have not doing this and we've enjoyed it. So our goal is to eat. We like to eat and everybody needs to eat. So. That's our goal is to help with the garden here. We can't feed everybody. No farmer could possibly do that. So you need to help yourselves and we're willing to help you help you. <laughs> so, Kevin, go ahead. Um, just to give a little bit of a brief rundown. Um, currently what we actively do is we, on a part-time basis for me and full-time for my wife, we operate a greenhouse and high tunnel production operation where we grow annuals, vegetables, hanging baskets. And we actually have a little bit of fruit production that we do inside of high tunnels as well. We grow about two acres of sweet corn and eight plantings. We have about an acre of fruit consisting of apples, raspberries, and grapes. We plant roughly, just to give you a little bit of an idea, size of scope, roughly 250 tomato plants, 150 pepper plants, and various multiple plantings through the season of zucchini, squash, cucumbers, melons, peas, beans, just wherever they fall into the correct season. And with that, I will let Carolyn open up on considering what to plant. Well, um, I guess the most important part is, are you going to eat what you want to plant? 
And if you're not going to eat it, don't waste your time growing it because that's just a lot of wasted energy. But if you have somebody that you know could use it, share it with somebody else. Um, are you going to grow herbs? Are you gonna grow a few flowers? It depends on what your goal is and how much you want to work. And I would tell you, don't start too big. Always start smaller than what you really think you're going to um, probably use. Your tomato plants are going to probably, um, I would say, outproduce exactly what you expect. Are you going to can any of it? Are you gonna dry any of it? Are you going to plan on just giving it away? Does your family eat it? Make sure that whatever you plan on doing, there's a, a, an end product for it. What are you, where is it gonna go? Don't be wasteful with your time and your energy and your resources. Um, when you're gonna plant flowers, are you thinking about the beneficial insects that you also need for pollinating? Throw in a few cilantro plants. Even if you don't like cilantro, they're a fabulous um, flower and nectar pollen source for beneficial insects. Um, but always try something new. Try something weird, like purple green beans. I like purple green beans. They're very pretty, but they cook up green. It's kind of disappointing. Purple asparagus. It's the most fabulous eating raw asparagus you could find. Most people wouldn't eat asparagus raw, but I, I would eat purple asparagus raw. And it stays, uh, it kind of like fades out too, but you can eat it raw. It tastes kind of like green peas more than asparagus. Um, but always try something strange. You never know what you're gonna like. Give it a whirl. So you can eat flowers. There are plenty of flowers. You can grow flowers and harvest them and put them in your vegetable salads. They look very pretty on top. They're very edible. Pansies, violets, um, nasturtiums. They're very peppery flavored. Give them a try. You might or you might not like them, but you don't know until you try it. So your, your goal is flowers, vegetables, herbs. Are you gonna use them? Are you, gonna, it, are you going to eat them? One of the most important things is select, selecting a spot that gets an adequate amount of sight, sunlight. A minimum would be six to eight hours. More than that would be ideal if it can. Just about all of your vegetable plants need more sun. Some, especially like tomatoes and peppers, will suffer tremendously if they don't have more sunlight. One good thing to do is don't be afraid to ask staff at a greenhouse where you're buying plants look on labels, look in seed catalogs, that information will all be there. One other thing also to remember is when you're looking at a site, don't pick the lowest spot in your yard where everything runs down to it and it sets wet all the time. The only thing you might be able to grow there is celery. Make sure an area can still be well drained but level enough to be workable. It is very difficult to deal with a garden that sets too wet or a garden that slopes too steeply. So you kind of want to look into that pretty carefully. Another thing to kind of keep in mind is when you select a site, pay attention. If you're planting right beside your neighbor and your neighbor has his lawn sprayed with herbicide to kill all the broadleaf in it with 2,4-D every three weeks, you're going to have some serious problems trying to grow a garden with cross drift that close. Um, I have seen it happen across roads. I've seen it hundreds of feet away. It's pretty serious. Um, if your lawn in itself has been treated with any product that would have contained 2,4-D or some of the active weed killing ingredients in it, you need to stop for at least a year prior to trying to plant anything, the residuals will do damage to an awful lot of vegetable crops you would plant. One of the ideal things, especially if you're starting in a late term in the spring, like if you're gonna plant this spring, you don't have a chance to do anything at last fall now, is probably remove the sod as opposed to till it under if you have the option of doing that. If you can remove the sod completely from the area and the plants don't have to compete with that, the nutrients, whether you use compost or fertilizers or mulches, 
the plant will be competing with the root system from the grass that you're destroying. You'll, you'll notice a big difference if you can get rid of that first. If you take the sod off, place it somewhere where it can be allowed to decompose, and then add it back to the garden the following season. Um, there's other options. If you're starting in the fall, sometimes you can smother the grass with newspaper, and put a layer of leaves on it. You can use grass if you're positive there's not weed killer in it. That's another thing I've often, you'll want to be really careful if a neighbor comes over to you and sees you're trying to put mulch down in your garden and stuff like that. If they offer to bring grass clippings over to you, make sure the grass clippings that you're getting don't have 2,4-D on them. If they do and you get rain on that 2,4-D, there can easily be enough residual there to kill what you're trying to grow. And I think that is about all I had. Now I'll leave Carol and speak for a few minutes on improving the soil that um, you have to work with. Yeah, sometimes our soil is pretty um, bare or basic, especially if you live in town or a, a new development or an allotment, they strip your, your topsoil you don't have topsoil to work with. So you need to add a lot of amendments, such as um, piling up leaves, uh, getting compost, uh, manure. Um, make sure if you're using manure compost that it's been composted for at least six months. Uh, be kind of careful with where you get your compost. If you go to some place like the city that has um, uh, clippings where they just dump everything into a big pile. I'd be very leery of using that initially on the garden. I would let that sit and then make sure that something grows in it off to the side before you put it on a garden. That can also have residual pesticides or uh, herbicides in it. You don't want to ruin your garden. That's defeating your purpose. So make sure that whatever you're getting is, is uh, clear or free from herbicides. Um, sometimes that can happen with hay mulches, so be careful with hay mulch. Straw mulch, generally you won't have a problem with an herbicide on it to damage anything in your garden, but you're gonna wanna add any kind of organic matter you can to a garden to start with. Your plants need lots of nutrients. If you're nutrient deficient, your plant is going to be very obvious in their deficiencies and your produce won't taste very good. It'll be kind of boring. So make sure you feed your plants, and that comes by starting with a good soil in your garden. Um, you can add some organic fertilizers. Job's makes a really nice, fairly inexpensive organic fertilizer. I like Job's, I use it all the time. Um, there's a couple other brands that I would use. But Job's is pretty simple to go pick that up at any hardware store or any garden center. I've never had a problem with any of Job's and it works very, very well. So make sure you fertilize your plants. They'll need a little bit of food throughout the season. Um, they get hungry when they start producing a lot of produce and you are picking it. They want, it, they want it some more to replenish so they can grow some more produce for you. So don't hesitate to feed your plants. Um, if you're concerned about your soil, you could have the county do a soil test for you and they'll tell you what you're deficient in. Then you could add only specifically what the nutrient deficiencies are. So make sure that you know, give it a try if things aren't growing as well as you would like. Um, the extension service through Medina County does that. I'm not sure if there's a charge for it. I've honestly never had them do it. Probably I should, but I haven't. Um, and when you're getting ready to start your garden, um, you're going to need to either till or dig. Um, if, if it's a small garden, working the soil with a soil fork or a spade, it's doable. You don't want to overwork your soil. You don't want um, something that looks like sand when you get done with it. Um, you just want to break it up so that those those plants aren't, the roots aren't compacted. They need oxygen and water needs to be able to um, be absorbed, not run off when you have a rain. So um, if you need a rototiller, you generally either have to ask somebody to help you out or if you're at our community garden, we do that for you. So don't hesitate to participate in our community garden. You got a lot of um, effort going on before you even have to show up. So don't hesitate to participate. We have a lot of fun there. 
We do the tilling for you. All you need to do is your weeding and your planting and carry your water. <laughs> so, and we have a hose on there so you can get, at least get it from the water source to a bucket. <laughs> so, um, yeah, don't hesitate to, you know, rototill. But you don't want to do it if it's too wet. You don't want to be working with too wet of soil that you're going to ruin your soil texture. It shouldn't do anything more than make a nice ball and crumble apart if you're getting ready to work your soil. If you're questioning it, ask somebody, ask for help. That's never, that's never a poor thing to do. Always ask for help if you are questioning whether it's a suitable soil texture or moisture. Um, there's no point in ruining your soil just one day early. I wouldn't be very happy if Kevin did that for me, so your plants wouldn't be happy either. <laughs> so then you're going to get ready to plant your plants. Kevin, you want to talk about picking your plants? One of the first things to remember is pay a lot of attention to the climate, the soil, and the sunlight in the area we're growing in. Pay attention to plants that are do well in our area. You can talk to fellow gardeners, you can get information online, you can get information from seed catalogs. If you try to pick a variety that you've heard is really, really good and it handles the high heat of Texas or southern Florida, you're probably going to have some issues, if, especially if it's a real late, long season type of crop. Um, pay attention to what you're planting as far as if you have in mind that you'd like to grow an heirloom tomato that you've heard is really excellent, that you would really like to try to eat, keep in mind that if you have in mind to grow three or four bushels of tomatoes to put juice or stewed tomatoes up, that that may not be the best choice. The productivity of the plant may not lend itself very well to accomplishing that. If you live in a particular area and you know you have particular types of insect or disease pressure, make sure you pay attention. There's simple things you can do that, I mean, sometimes marigolds planted on the edge of a garden is a common thing to keep cucumber beetles down. Um, be aware of disease pressure. If you've got neighbors or you've had a lot of problem in an area with plant disease, a lot of times tomatoes and peppers even strawberry, there's a lot of plants that are very susceptible to especially the root diseases. Once that's there, it's very difficult to deal with that. Not impossible, but difficult. Common vegetables that are pretty easy to get a start with if you've never done it before would be cucumbers, lettuce, peppers, tomatoes. And one comment I will make, especially in respect to the garden, uptown in Bird Street is when you plant a garden, pay attention, especially sometimes if you plant it alongside of woods. Be aware of the fact that you may have to deal with some competition for what you're trying to grow from wildlife. <laughs> it, it's a very real thing to, if you're planting a garden at your home, you may need to deal with some type of fencing, whether it's electric, whether it's something just to keep rabbits and stuff out. but you can have an awful lot of work destroyed really fast if you're not ready for it. So it, it pays to kind of be aware of what's around there. And simple ways to do that is set up a game camera in the area where you'll have a chance to get an idea of what's going on out there when you're not there. Carolyn? Okay, well, when we start planting our garden, um, we need to Think about how cold it still is, and is the ground still cold? Some plants and some crops do well in cold weather. Cold ground doesn't bother them. But you'll want to wait till the ground warms up before you start planting things like peppers and tomatoes. They don't like cold feet. They don't like cold, wet feet. And generally, I would not um, say that before Memorial Day is a good time to plant our gardens in our area. They, generally just don't do real well. We we'll usually get a late cold snap and that stresses our tomatoes and our peppers and they really struggle the rest of the winter, or the rest, I'm sorry, the rest of the summer. They don't, they don't grow well. It, it's not worth your time to leave them in. I've tried it. We had a frost a couple of years ago and I left my row of tomatoes in and they struggled the entire year. 
it was one of my worst crops because I was trying to nurse them along. It just doesn't pay to, to rush to get them in there. So make sure that when you're planting your plants, you're planting in an appropriate weather window for those plants. Some things you can start from seed very easily in the garden. Um, and if you ever buy a packet of seeds, um, you'll notice that your packet of seed has varying amounts of seeds in it. Generally, a packet of seeds plants a 50-foot row, in case you never knew that. So if, for like our community garden, we don't need enough for a 50-foot row unless you're planting your whole plot because that's a lot of green beans or a lot of lettuce. Share your packets of seeds. Go together and buy your seeds if you don't need that many. Um, saving seeds from one year to the next works for some seeds, but not for everything. You'll get very disappointed when you go to plant your lettuce seeds and nothing grows the next year and it was a waste of saving those seeds and you could have just shared them and, and not wasted saving them, keeping track of them. Um, so make sure that you're just um, thinking about how far a packet of seeds goes. Are you going to use all of that? Most people wouldn't use a 50 foot row of lettuce. I know I would never eat a 50 foot row of lettuce, but I can sure pick a lot of lettuce and put it in bags. And I'll bring it to my farmer's market so you guys can buy it if you don't want to grow it, okay? <laughs> um, but um, if you're gonna start your seeds, um, things like peppers and eggplant, it is almost time to get ready to start those. They take um, eight to 10 weeks before you put them in the garden. Uh, something like lettuce, sunflowers, those things you can put directly into the garden. If you're gonna grow something from seed, you want a heat mat and a grow light. Otherwise, they're gonna struggle. They're not gonna have enough light inside your house and they're probably not gonna be warm enough to germinate. I often soak my pepper seeds overnight in water and they'll swell up and they get nice and fat and those are much nicer and easier to germinate seeds than planting a dry seed in dry mix. Um, never use garden soil to plant your seedlings in. Always go buy a bag of Pro Mix or some kind of a soilless mix in a bale or a bag at um, a garden center. Um, otherwise, you're, you have too many molds, you have bacteria, you have diseases going on before your plant ever gets established. Um, it's the end of your plant and you wasted all that time. So. Um, spend a couple dollars on a bag of soilless mix. It's sterile, it's not going to um, attack your plants with pathogens already inoculated in it. Um, one comment quickly about, um, that's gonna change a little bit as we go from in the greenhouse stage, which is someone's trying to raise a few tomatoes or peppers or something on a hot mat. If you if you're growing it that way, you never want to let a seedling when it's young completely dry out. As the plant gets bigger, you want to back off on the watering, you want to harden and toughen the plant up so it can deal with not getting as much water. Um, once the plant gets a little bit bigger and you're transplanting into the garden, I would encourage someone, even a novice, to give serious thought to using drip irrigation to water. Plants especially tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, a steady amount of water rather than a glut of it is a tremendous advantage to the quality of the fruit and the production of the plant. Drip irrigation also gives you the option of addling fertilizer through the drip irrigation. And before you think that sounds like something really complicated that only a commercial producer could do, you can go on to many sites on the internet, um, Greenhouse Megastore. There's a number of local businesses in the Amish community that Yoder's Produce, um, Berlin Seed probably as well. They would sell for a small garden where people could do that and you could even set up to run fertilizer through those. Not as involved probably as what we would use, but it would still enable you to, to add a liquid fertilizer to the plant as you're growing it. And you, they could be organic, it can be synthetic, either one. Regardless of how you water, whether it would be with drip or with a garden hose, make sure you water slowly. 
If you just wet the top down real heavy and you have no water getting down into the root zone of the plant down or three or four inches, the water really doesn't have a lot of opportunity to do much good. Pay attention to the type of soil you have. Is it clay? Do you have a lot of topsoil? Is there, there a lot of organic matter in it? Um, what kind of weather conditions are going around the time you're trying to water? Is it extremely sunny and hot? Is it really windy? A couple of things, especially going backtracking a little bit into the topic of disease control. If you orient a garden and you can run your rows parallel to the direction of prevailing wind, you'll notice that the Bird Street Park, it does exactly that. If you can run your rows of your garden parallel to the prevailing wind. You will increase your air movement through there and you will have to fight disease pressure, especially fungal diseases, far less than you will otherwise. When, when you see things start, let, let a plant dry out to, to where you see it starting to dry down and then water it. Feel your soil at that point down to three, four inches deep and make sure you still have water to Stick three or four inches. Stick your finger in. Yeah. <laughs> That's an excellent way to do it. If you want to, you can buy meters. There's a lot of different things you can do. That way you make sure it's soaking off, it's soaking down in instead of running off. The ideal time to water, if you can possibly do it, and we do this a lot on our place, is watering in the early morning. Especially anything that has to be watered overhead. You do not want a plant to be watered right before it gets dark. That is a tremendous encouragement to fungal diseases. You will definitely increase the amount of struggle you have with a plant by watering late at night. It helps a little bit if you're doing it to the root zone only by doing it through drip irrigation. But it's just something that a lot of times can keep things simpler. One other thing that helps to hold moisture down there, and I'll let Carolyn speak about it a little bit and ways to do it and types, would be using mulch on a garden. Yep, we can, um, we use plastic mulch just because we grow so much. Um, it's not practical for us to use compost mulch or wood chips. Um, you can use shredded paper. If you have, know somebody gets a, still gets a newspaper, um, you can shred that and use it as a mulch. Um, uh, leaves, if you have last year's pile of leaves or if you see people's bags, you go around in the dark and you sneak them, <laughs> take them off the curb. <laughs> I don't know, I feel kind of funny, but you know, hey, people's leaves will work on my yard just as well as they'll work on somebody else's. Um, but you put some mulch on there to re retain the moisture in the soil instead of letting it dry out so much. If you're paying for water because you're in town, that can be, um, get pretty costly. So mulch your plants to keep the moisture in and it also helps keep the weeds down. It keeps your uh, plants, the soil um, friable so that it doesn't get packed and hard so the roots can't reach farther. Um, just, it's just, as, it, as the summer proceeds, it breaks down, it becomes organic matter in your garden. It just adds to it. So don't hesitate to put in. Um, I would highly stress, be very careful with hay mulch. Hay mulch will grip, get moldy if it's wet it will add a lot of nutrients once it's breaking down, but you don't want to add molds to your garden. Um, it also can lend a lot of weed seeds to your garden. So be careful with hay mulch. I'm not gonna tell you not to use it because it does add organic matter and nutrients. Um, straw, straw mulch would probably be a little bit better. Wood chips, are, um, as long as you've let them sit for a year, don't ever use freshly ground wood chips. You'll suck all the nitrogen out of your garden and you will not be able to get anything to grow. But they make a beautiful second year mulch on your garden. So if you know somebody that is using or chipping wood, feel free to ask for wood chips, but always, always, always double check. Cheryl Kreider will tell you this is true. Do not ever use black walnut chips in your garden ever, 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 ever. You will kill your plants for the next seven years. So make sure that what, if you're getting wood chips from anybody that they are never contaminated with black walnut chips. Um, but other than that, I'm not sure that I could off the top of my head tell you that there's any that you shouldn't use other than that. 
one of the things, now your garden's beginning to grow and it's kind of important to pay attention with what's going on around you. Um, we use something called integrated pest management, which involves looking for diseases, looking for pests, paying attention to, to what's going on around you as a whole thing. Um, I would strongly encourage, especially on a small scale, don't be afraid to use insecticidal soaps. Um, I would not, unless you're pretty handy with searching everything out, don't just spray stuff that's kind of a indiscriminate or a broad spectrum type of insecticide on plants without knowing a lot about it. We try pretty hard to target our problem. I do not like to just dump insecticides on stuff. For instance, one thing to pay attention to is, for instance, tomato worms. There's a, Carolyn can tell you the name of the little fly or tachnid wasp. wasps. It's a tachnid wasp. And, uh, that if you see them already on the tomato worm, you're really just as far ahead to leave that that way rather than do anything more. It will kill the tomato worm. In addition to that, I do believe the tachnid wasp also Brachnid attack. or tachnid? Bra I, I, I'm gonna, they also. I'm, Drawing a blank. They also attack other pests in the garden. So by not putting the broad spectrum insecticide on there, you're leaving a pest that has the capability of doing good in the garden there because there's a lot of good bugs in a garden. Ladybugs, for instance, are one of the, in our greenhouses, we probably go, have we gone through probably five to 6,000 ladybugs in a season? Oh yeah, I buy a lot of ladybugs. I buy them up at the, um across from 94, Hertz's Greenhouse, if you're ever looking for ladybugs for your garden, Hertz's Greenhouse is where you would go buy them. And the reason for that is they're excellent for aphid control. A lot of times on the back of the leaves of plants, you'll see where aphids have gotten in there and they've done a lot of damage and you can try soapy water and you can try a lot of different things, but it's amazing, especially in the greenhouse, which is like a perfect environment for the aphid. You get the ladybugs in there, they do a very good job of cleaning them up. Yep. And you, one other thing that I will add, especially with a lot of plants, especially like for instance our sweet corn, tomatoes, peppers, a lot of these are really heavy feeders. It may be that you'll need to fertilize more than just when you initially plant. And once you do it a little for a little while, you'll find different chemicals at different points in the production make a difference. I mean, your fertilizers should be rich in phosphorus when it's in the root development stage. Your fertilizer should be rich in potassium when it's in the fruit development stage. So there's just a lot of things to kind of keep in mind there that you want to pay attention to. The brachnid wasp is our tachnic wasp, whichever it is, that looks like little teeny tiny white cocoons on top of your tomato worm, on your hornworm if you ever see them. Always leave that to develop. It looks like little itty bitty Q-tip ends stuck to the top of the worm. Rows and rows of them. Anything else? I think we pretty okay. well covered it. Well, I have a few tools to share with you. Um, they're just little simple tricks and tips for the garden. When you are writing on labels for your garden, always use either a pencil, a contractor's permanent marker, or Sharpie makes an industrial permanent marker. Um, a regular permanent marker fades out within a couple of weeks in the garden and you cannot read it. So you can use paint sticks, you can use popsicle sticks, you can, um, I suppose, even laminate a piece of paper with um, those little laminator things you can get at home now. Um, you can write right on those, you can punch a hole in them, you can tie them to your tomato cage or your pepper cage if you're using cages. Um, but those, those um, couple little tools make a huge difference by labeling your garden, especially if you have specific tomatoes that you would like to know what tomatoes they are if you're only planting one. So you have a black crim and you have a purple Russian and you have some other black tomato, you want to keep track of which one is which. Trust me, you'll forget pretty quick where you planted which one. Um, hand pruners. Some of my favorites are Felco's. Um, ARS is a really nice hand pruner. You really do need a pair of hand pruners. Um, a nice 
skinny tip. Um, Felco is the only one that I know of that makes a left-handed hand pruner. So if you're left-handed, Felco, Felco makes a left-handed pair of hand pruners. There aren't too many to choose from if you're left-handed, and we all know that if you're using the wrong tool, it makes your life just much more difficult, and you'll tend to ruin your fruit trying to pick something because you can't get the tip in there and cut it the right way either. Um, another quick tip. Okay, we all need a tape measure in our garden, but this is a pain and the patuski to use. So I label my hoe handle. I just take my permanent marker and I make a six inch mark, a 12 inch mark, a 15 inch mark, an 18 inch mark, and then more, um, another 24 and then another 36. It makes it much simpler than having a tape measure that you're constantly fiddling around with. Um, here, I'm gonna get up a second. If I can. You can buy cheap Fisker plastic trowels. I would not normally say buy cheap tools. I would always say buy the best quality you can afford. If you are buying cheap junky tools, they're hard to work with. But this one is one of the better cheap junky tools I have found for cheap junky tools. It's easy if you lose it, it's not quite as painful because you only paid a dollar for that thing. Um, when we are spraying small quantities of soapy water or even just plain water, if, you're, if you see um, powdery mildew on your plants, don't hesitate to take a, a hose and give it a good strong spray. If you're spraying something like a soapy water, get a little pump sprayer bottle. It's way easier than a, a hand pump sprayer. Um, don't hesitate, and they're not very expensive. I don't doubt if they're more than $10. Um, a garden soil thermometer. If you're making compost, you need to know how warm your compost is and make sure it's working. Um, it tells you how warm your garden soil is so that you're on time or on track for planting your tomatoes. You don't want garden soil that's 50 degrees. Your tomatoes will not thank you at all. Um, I have fruit snips. They have a much skinnier blade than um, regular pruners. So if you're growing a lot of fruit and you're, um, or eggplant, something that is really hard to pick, um, Get, get an appropriate pair of snips or pruners for that. Um, string, a big long piece of garden string for making straight rows. I, none of these things are very expensive, but don't hesitate to use them. No one likes their rows um, all wiggly and jiggly and they're going different directions and it looks terrible. Not that your plants don't grow as well, but it looks terrible. I hate unstraight rows. <laughs> um, and don't hesitate to go online and look at lots of seed catalogs because there's lots of different ones to choose from. Lots of different plants. There's thousands and thousands of every variety of everything out there. You can go wrong, trust me. <laughs> you can grow a whole garden of things you didn't like this year. But that's not normal. It's, you're probably gonna find something you really, really like. Don't hesitate to try something different or unusual. Um, black tomatoes are probably one of my favorite. I like green when ripe tomatoes. I like purple carrots, I like purple asparagus, and I like purple green beans. <laughs> so, you know, don't, don't hesitate to ask questions. Don't hesitate to participate. We would like to see you at the community garden. That's the funnest place to be because there's lots of people there usually. So, but I think I'm done. Are you done? I believe so. I'm sure there's lots more we could talk about, but I'm sure there's lots of questions. Well, thank you, Kevin and Carolyn. Uh, it's a lot of information. Appreciate you trying to condense it. And, and we also appreciate that um, we are all in our element gardening when we are not behind a screen. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, I, I know from my own experience of uh, working in the garden, not working as much as you guys have, but being there and seeing when you guys really get into the to the work, um, just um, the opportunity to learn so much. Uh, and that's I think when when the when the road hits the pavement, so to speak, is really when you get into the ground. 
Um, and so we've got questions coming in here now, and there's a little bit of an exchange here between Terry Leiter and uh, Janet uh, Lemecker. And uh, Terry asked, would you recommend using a weed blocker fabric? Janet um, shared her experience that it never uh, let the grass, never let the grass grow in it, but you will never be able to pull it out. There, there are as big there are big grassroots underneath that happens if you don't check it for a long time. Any thoughts on that? Um, we do use um, a, a ground cover, but we pull it up every year. We don't generally plant in it. We use it in between rows um, just to keep the weeds down so we aren't constantly um, trying to weed or mow or take a weed eater through there. I don't have time to weed eat everything. Um, that's my method of weeding the garden if I absolutely have to is the weed eater, but the, the ground fabric does a great job, but I don't generally plant in it. All right, we've got another question from Jane Sedmack. How can you keep plants healthy between the time you buy and plant at the end of May? Um, my th thought is first, they have to be healthy when you get them. Um, I've been to a few garden centers that I was less than impressed with the quality of the plant already. Make sure that there's no disease on that plant. Make sure there's no funky colors going on. Um, nothing dried or crispy. Um, but don't let it get too cold. Keep it outside as much as possible. Even if it gets cold, take it outside during the day as long as it's not below probably 45 degrees. Keep it outside. Bring it in at nighttime or put it in the garage at nighttime so that it's not getting too cold. And make sure you give it a little bit of fertilizer. It probably is ready for some by the time you get it. Kevin, did you have anything to add to that? Not a whole lot. That was that was pretty accurate. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we've got another one from uh, from Stephanie. Let's see, Stephanie Martin. Why do my larger tomatoes split at the bottom? There again would be one of the cases where I would probably encourage you to make sure you're getting a steady amount of water to the tomato. I have seen lots of times, for instance, we grow the bulk of our tomato crop inside of a high tunnel. The reason for that, what a high tunnel is, I'll go back up a little bit, make sure everyone understands. It's a greenhouse that is uncovered, that is unheated, that has one cover, one cover of a sheet of plastic on top of it. What that does is I'm doing all of my watering in the root zone of the plant instead of the leaf zone of the plant. When tomatoes are outside and they go through a prolonged dry period, and all of a sudden you get a wet period, every tomato on the plant is going to, those leaves are just going to absorb all that moisture and it will crack all the fruit that is getting close to the ripening stage. We have gone through fields many times when we're anticipating heavy rains, almost in the dark, going through cleaning off anything with any amount of color on it, knowing full well they're all gonna be split just as soon as the rain hits. That's actually a very common problem. And it will not hurt to pick your tomato. As soon as you see a little bit of color blush in the bottom of that tomato, go ahead and pick it. More likely you're gonna, not gonna get it if you don't pick it, especially if it's an heirloom. Um, they tend to be a little bit softer, a little more fragile. Pick that tomato and take it in the house and set it on the counter. Do, don't sit it on the windowsill where it's going to get direct sun. You can burn little spots right on the side of the tomato because it, it sits right in direct sun. It'll still ripen without direct sun. But pick those as soon as they start to color and don't hesitate to pick them if you know it's going to rain. That's typical for um, a lot of tomatoes. They just absorb too much water and the skin is not elastic. The skin is, it's, um, it's like a sheet of vinyl. It's not going to stretch. What kind of, cre and so as a follow-up to that, what kind of creative strategies might somebody employ in a situation like a community garden where you can't run a slow drip for a longer period of time? And, and then also I'm thinking about your other comment about the, um, um, avoid watering at night. Uh, how in a in a situation in a backyard or at a community garden where you're limited in terms of the time, could you mitigate the the risk of the tomato splitting? Um, a water jug with a little hole 
and you fill a couple of water jugs and let that drip slowly down so that it waters slowly will help. Um, don't get your foliage wet at nighttime. If you're watering at nighttime, that water jug's perfect. It's not going to hurt anything. The, the wet foliage is what's contributing to um, the fungal diseases um, starting at nighttime and destroying your crop. Very good. Thank you. Let me find the next question here. There are a lot coming in. Um, this, this question is from Sk uh, Caitlin Schofield. If we added a lot of organic material and composted manure in the fall, what do we need to do now in the spring to prepare the soil? A good tilling probably. Um, get ahead of your weeds if you have weeds started before you um, do your tilling. Don't hesitate to take a weed eater through there and cut them off rather than just tilling them under. If you're tilling under the plant with its root, you can um, start a whole new plant again. Um, composting manure tends to um, have a lot of weed seeds in it, so you're just going to have to deal with the weed seeds as they germinate. Thank you. We've got one from another one from Jane Sedmack. Can I plant next to my shed wall or will it get too hot? I suppose it depends on what color your shed wall would be. Um, I probably wouldn't be worried about that unless it was brick. If it's brick, it would tend to absorb an enormous amount of heat during the day and that can burn your plants. But I wouldn't worry about planting next to your shed wall. If that's the space you have to work with, use it. All right, we've got one from Denise. I've had terrible pest problems with the brassica family. Any tips? Dipel. Dipel, <laughs> yep. It's an organic compound that when the cabbage looper eats the compound, it's, they just instantly stop feeding and they won't last very long. Um, you should be able to buy that at just about any small garden center. Extremely effective. I mean, it's even used in commercial production and you can buy small quantities of it very reasonably. It's not expensive. It's a powder, you'd shake it on, and as soon as you have a rain or a, a heavy dew, and the, because brassicas tend to roll up the water and it sheds off like uh, it has rain -X on it, you'll need to put the um, dipel back on. The other thing you could do is cover your plants. Um, you're gonna have to use something like a um, insect barrier. You can um, put it on, um, an individual plant, kind of tuck it in at the bottom, but the dipel is a really good, um, inexpensive way to not spend an enormous amount of labor and effort trying to protect those plants. Very good, thank you. Um, there was a, a follow-up comment here from um, from Gary Bernard, one of our um, community garden committee members, that blossom end rot is caused by lack of calcium. Mm -hmm. That is very true. So that gets back to the soil amendment uh, work that you were talking about in the preparation phase. There's also a spray you can use for blossom end rot, and that actually um, happens to both peppers and tomatoes. They're very heavy calcium feeders. Um, I don't remember what the spray is called, but you put that on it. It's a calcium spray, the plant that absorbs it. Um, but that actually starts at cell formation of the blossom. So it's not something that's going to like all of a sudden start. If you, and it never, I would say, I've never seen it affect a cherry tomato plant, only large tomatoes. Um, it's, it's immediate, as soon as that plant starts forming its tomato, you'll see a little gray spot on the bottom. As the tomato matures, it just doesn't get any better. It just gets worse. One thing also to keep in mind too, especially with plants, especially the tomato family, um, when you need a high, you can have a lot of calcium in the ground that at times is not available. If your ground does not have good amounts of manganese and boron on it, the tomato plant, an apple tree, there's a lot of plants that won't be able to utilize the calcium that's in the ground because of the manganese or boron deficiency. You'll find many good high quality fertilizers Pay attention when you buy your fertilizer. Look for manganese and boron on that label. It is- Or it might say mo micronutrients on it. Maybe, um, maybe you could speak to it. When we, when we did the work of preparing the community garden at Bird Park, I know that some soil testing was done. 
Mm -hmm. uh, could you maybe give some advice about how uh, a first time gardener might approach that? Um, the soil testing, I think that was, uh, normally you would send that to the um, county extension office and they would do your soil test and they would tell you exactly what you need. You would go around and you take a little bit of soil from different parts of your garden. Um, you dig down probably six or eight inches if I'm recalling correctly. And you mix it all up and you send it up to them and um, they will do a soil analysis and tell you what you're deficient in or what you have an excess of um, or what you just should add. And you could add things like um, feather meal or bone meal or blood meal there's a lot of different individual um, nutrients that um, would supply those those needs. There's green sand, there's um, all kinds of individual things that are available. Um, I use a lot of tomato tone. It also is um, has a lot of calcium in it for your um, developing tomatoes. Um, once again, a, a good, solid, fertilized, enriched, um, growing medium is always important for getting good developed fruit. Very good. Um, a question from Ann. I have excessive weeds, many different kinds that take over everywhere in my garden quickly. I almost think that we should let Ann un uh, do her mic here if, um, if you need to ask her more questions about that. She's looking for help there. So are, are these, is it grass weeds or broadleaf weeds? Does Ann have an answer for me? Um, but um, weeds are, them. yeah, weeds are weeds. I, they are, a, they're the bane of every gardener. And it's a daily, you need to walk through your garden two or three times a week and get them when they're small. Um, getting ahead of your weeds before you start a garden goes a long ways. Um, smothering them, mulching them. Make sure that you don't let them go to seed. One plant can add seven years worth of um, probably weeding time in your life. <laughs> Just get ahead of them. Okay, we've got a question from Stephanie Martin. Would the water jugs with holes in the bottom be enough water for cucumbers, zucchini, and peppers also? I don't know why not. You want to give them a good slow steady um, watering and if that's what you have to work with there's no and, and it also helps especially if you're having cool nights you can leave water jugs next to your plants um, make sure they're ones that don't have the holes um, that'll help keep a small a microclimate for around your plant where it's you know cooler in nighttime especially at the beginning of the season use those milk, those milk jugs later in the season poke little holes in them and and make sure they're they're kind of little you don't need a great big steady stream running out and across the garden. But yes, they will work for all of your plants. We have a question from Bethany Miller. Tips for powdery, powdery mildew. It was horrible on my pumpkins last year and eventually ended up on my zucchinis too. Um, powdery mildew is the bane of our gardening existence too, just like weeds. Um, one of the first things you can do is that spray of good strong water on your leaves, on the top and on the bottom. Um, I have actually saved a few crops by making sure I got out there several times, at least once a day, several times a week, go out there and start spraying those, those leaves if you can get your hose back to them. Um, the next best, uh, the first thing you should probably do is grow powdery mildew resistant varieties. Um, and then after that, uh, you can go to a uh, fungal spray if you, if you have to. If You could probably try some neem oil um, if you wanna try to stay organic. I'm not sure how many organic fungicides there are available. I know there's a lot of synthetic ones, um, but if you're not spraying your fruit with that synthetic chemical, I'm not as worried about um, trying to, um, pumpkins, are you eating them? I mean, if you're just growing them so you have the pumpkins for your porch, um, the daconil is a great spray. Um, it's not one we would recommend at the community garden because we want to keep their, everything there as organic as possible. Um, but the first thing is to grow powdery mildew resistant varieties and then spray first with water and then go to a fungicide if you have to. 
the, or, the organic equivalent of that would be oxidate. And also a lot of times with- Oh, um, you can't, you, sorry, you can't buy oxidate. That's also a large volume, but yeah, if you know somebody, you probably could get some of it. <laughs> Another <awesome>. thing <laughs> that is a lot of times pretty effective if you can catch it early on, there's times even milk on powdery mildew, oh, that's mixed true. down and diluted, mm -hmm. will actually make a difference milk. to kill powdery mildew. But if you wait until the plant's dying from the powdery mildew, the milk won't do anything. And chances are even the daconil won't at that stage either. It, yeah. It's something where you've got to pay attention to your plant and take care of your plant ongoing. So some research maybe on uh, seeing some images of the very earliest stages of it so you can get ahead of it before look, it gets... They'll just look like little dots on your leaf, little white dots. And that's the beginning of your powdery mildew. And usually you're starting with your cooler nights that you see the, the powdery mildew starts, are really humid nights. So. Thank you. Um, another question from Caitlin Schofield. What do you recommend for leaf mold on tomatoes? Do you think watering at night could be the cause of the issue? Um, everybody gets it. It's just part of growing tomatoes and watering at nighttime will not um, benefit them in any way whatsoever. Uh, the first thing I do is I, if I see them, I pick them off. Any leaf that has powdery mildew on it or leaf mold on it, I pick that off immediately. Once again, spraying with water and um, the neem oil, um, diluted milk, and then you can move on to um, a synthetic spray just like you would with the pumpkins or the, the zucchinis. One thing to keep in mind too is a lot of times some of those tomato diseases are very easy to confuse. You can get leaf molds, you can get late and early blight, you can get bacterial speck, bacterial spot. Some of those are very difficult to control. It's extremely important to be planting tomatoes where they're exposed to wind as much as possible. Oh, it, it, don't plant them, conden don't, don't condense your tomatoes. Give them a lot of space. Um, one of the things organically that I would p feel pretty comfortable with anybody using, provided they follow the directions, would be a copper product. You can buy them about anywhere. And just follow the directions on the label if you use copper. Copper will make a big difference on a lot of the leaf diseases if, if you follow the directions on it. Very good. And just one clarification, one of our committee members, Cami Willis, did a quick check for us. And according to their website, the Extension Office of Medina County now lists a few local labs to use. Uh, that, and they're not doing the soil testing directly on site. So it is something you can do and the resources are available from the County Extension Office. Okay, thank you, Cami. So as, as we kind of come to the close here tonight, I think I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that um, there's a lot to know about gardening, obviously, and anybody who's who's uh, tuning in tonight who's had their uh, thumb initiated <laughs> uh, knows. Uh, and, and so it's really important that we stress that the point of the community garden on, uh, on one important level is to make sure that people succeed. And we have a community of support at the garden of experienced gardeners like Kevin and Carolyn. And, uh, and the rest of our garden committee here, we have Cami Willis is one of those members, Gary Barnard, uh, and uh, we have David Williams, David G. Williams, not David Williams of uh, Wadsworth City Council, uh, David G. Williams, um, and Cheryl Kreider, and, and uh, our administrative uh, genius, Sandy Papp, who's been keeping us in order uh, all, all the way along. We're, and everybody is here to is to help is here to help everybody succeed. Um, and so we're we're establishing through this garden a community of learning. Don't be afraid uh, if you don't have the space in your backyard, or if you have the space in your yard, but you'd rather be part of a community um, where you have that direct support. Uh, please consider going to wadsworthlibrary.com/garden. There's a form that you can fill out to apply for a garden plot. We are giving first priority to those who live in the immediate area in the city and township proper. Um, but anybody is welcome who lives in the region to, to put in that application. 
Um, the applications are coming in and uh, there are over 32 plots at the garden and we expect they will probably all fill up this year. So please get your name uh, in the hopper sooner than later. Uh, our next program we're aiming to have in the garden on March 25th. It's Ready, Set, Garden. It's a hands-on demonstration again with Kevin and Carolyn in the garden and the rest of the members of the committee. Um, and weather permitting, we're gonna plan on being there even if it means a little bit of rain um, and the committee is planning for that. So we look forward to seeing you there. If you're interested, please do register at wadsworthlibrary.com. Go ahead and click on events, find that date on the calendar uh, and you can register. And the third of these, uh, three initial programs is dig into composting. And that's gonna be a hands-on uh, uh, demonstration with Gary Barnard and David Williams of the garden committee getting into the compost there at the garden, uh, showing you how it's done and letting you try your hand at that uh, on site. So as the season gets closer, we're hoping to see you in the garden. Um, and at this point, I'd really like to just open it up to anybody else from the committee. If there's anything you'd like to share, go ahead and uh, unmute your mic and jump in if you'd like to add anything. The only thing else I would like to add is, you know, there's, there's more than one way to garden. So don't think that there's only we can garden in the soil. We can do um, container gardening. We can do straw bale gardening, which is one of the projects I would like to try this year. Um, there are raised beds, there's all kinds of, there's, there's different methods, so don't hesitate to try something new. If you come join us at the garden over on in New Bird Street Park, one of the really great benefits when Daniel was talking about um, community is you do get to see people on a fairly regular basis, the people that um, garden and water about the same time as you do. It's very pleasant over there. Um, there's always a lot of people around, so it's just a nice evening or afternoon or morning there. A lot of times we'll take our lawn chairs and work a little and visit a little and work a little and visit a little, and it's just a really nice way to spend a day. Thank you, Cammie. Sandy, did you want to add anything? I just wanted to say that Carolyn and um, her husband, you guys did a great job. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It was a little bit intimidating. We haven't done anything like this before. <laughs> no, you rocked it. Oh, you well, thank you. Great. I, enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Did you enjoy it? Okay. Yeah, it was cool. I volunteered for all kinds of things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, that, now that we know you can do it, here we go. <laughs> well, well thanks. Daniel and Tim for all that you guys did. Yeah, we were, we are glad to open it up and make this help to make this possible. And again, without the, this committee, and it looks like Gary is online. Hey, yeah, I unmuted myself. I'd like to thank Kevin and Carolyn for their good information. I'm sure we'll have some more when we get together that next meeting. Yeah, we'll look forward to that. And I'm sure the information will be just as valuable, if not more so than what we've learned tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Well, thank you everybody for being here tonight. Thank you, Kevin and Carolyn. And again, uh, if you're interested, please go to www.wadsworthlibrary.com slash garden, and you can learn more about the garden there. There are videos up that Gary produced through uh, with WCTV. Um, about the setting up of the garden. Uh, you can watch it, the groundbreaking and the garden growing to life uh, last year right there on that webpage. Uh, so we encourage you to uh, go ahead and submit or give us a call and, uh, and we'll get you the information that you need. Thank you and have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night.